when management threw away the Guardian of the Machine. Context. The machine was made for creating grooves and cuts in cardboard. A 20 foot by 20 foot machine made of iron, wrought iron, and cast iron. The only piece of computer on her was an aftermarket safety system with a lock and key. My workmates and I started to use chalk to mark out common settings and help us know if things were rubbing correctly or wrongly. So we were using our own money to buy chalk to use at work. And one of the guys would buy those massive kid sidewalk chalks as thick as a candy bar. Well, during downtime or setups, or while waiting for the last piece to be set up by the last guy, we would take turns carving pieces of chalk into rough shapes like Buddha, Tiki, cats, and it would become the guardian of the machine. Uh, until we actually used it. Cue management seeing us have any sort of fun or engagement as <gasps> humans. Blasphemy. Tosses it, demands we never have it in the building again. If it isn't provided by the company, then it isn't allowed. Vibration on the 20th of the 7th. Bolts get loose. Pieces rub. Friction. Heat. Cardboard dust. Fire. And to this day, there is probably a piece of company bought chalk that has been amateurly carved upon sitting on that machine. Never mess with the guardian of the machine. I don't know why, but this suddenly sounds like a poem. Okay, it will ship today. A friend of mine did this. When I was a tech at a calibration lab, we had a torque wrench arrive for calibration. Now, to do the job right, you must let the wrench sit in the lab until it has reached the same temperature as the lab and the calibration standards. Do you get that? I hope you do because I don't. It was winter and the wrench was cold. Unheated shipping truck, warehouses, etc. So this wrench was put on the shelf to acclimate, which would take 24 to 48 hours. Now that afternoon, one of the salespeople told the torque tech that this wrench must ship today because it was a big customer and he wanted to make a good impression. The tech obviously said that it couldn't because it had to acclimate before being calibrated. This salesperson was the sort of irresistible force who thought that no one could or would ever stand in his way. Note, he was also not supposed to be in the lab or in any way involved in production. He was also kind of an a-hole. Yeah, just to add a little bit of sprinkle on top there. Already not having any authority in the matter, but you know, yeah, yeah, he's also a, a big butthead. So the tech giant explained that the wrench could not be calibrated until at least the next day. Otherwise, the calibration would not be a good one and we don't do it like that. That's when the salesperson exploded and flew his big flag high. Repeated several times that it must ship today. After the 10 minute tirade had ended, the tech just told him it will ship today. <laughs> and my mummy told me complaining and sulking wouldn't get me anywhere in life. So the salesperson huffed back to the sales department, gratified that he'd got his way again. As soon as he was gone, the tech processed the order as a return as is and put it on the shipping cart. The wrench did indeed ship that day without a calibration certificate. The customer was miffed. The subsequent investigation did not show the salesperson in a good light. He was officially reprimanded. It's a very small thing, but it's making me smile. I'm sorry, what? Hey viewer, I didn't realize we're gonna read a post from your girlfriend. One of our trucks was financed through Alley. We've been paying extra every month since we bought it. Not much, but a little. Well, a month or so ago, the payment was delayed. Mailed it on time, but it didn't get there and get processed fast enough, so they started calling and harassing our office staff. This despite the fact that we were actually well ahead on what we owed. This month, they sent me a bill, like they do every month. But this month, the amount due is zero dollars. Oh, right, because you're so far ahead that even like the bill they're sending you is still totally paid already. <laughs> so I'm sending them a check for zero dollars and zero cents. And I'm sending it in plenty of time to get there by the due date. Oh, an update. <laughs> I just got the check back, along with a letter from them dated the day after the due date, thanking me for sending it. But no phone calls harassing my staff, so I'll count that as a win. That time I was a victim of malicious compliance, and it still makes me laugh. About 30 years ago, I was an admin and facilities manager of a royal mail sorting office, and one day, every one of the liquid soap dispensers in the toilet was empty. So I found a passing cleaner and told him, to which he said, Not my job. 
job. That's the night cleaner's job to fill them up. Yeah, well, obviously he didn't do it. So you need to go to the cleaning cupboard, get some soap, and make sure there's some in each of the dispensers so people can wash their hands. Now, I go back upstairs to my ivory tower, and five minutes later, I get a phone call to say, I need to sort out the liquid soap dispensers in the toilet. Go back downstairs, and in each liquid soap dispenser, there's a solid bar of soap. <laughs> you know what? This is one of those circumstances where I'm actually not at all on the malicious compliance side. Soap is literally like a biohazard preventative measure. Hope he wasn't telling you to cut corners. They were telling you to make up for your co-worker's terrible work ethic. Like, you know, snap at your co-worker, not at the person who wants to be able to wash their hands. Cue the school counselor. I'm a high school teacher and taught, among other subjects, politics at my previous school. We were briefed over and over again to be on the lookout for any sign that a student might be in psychological distress. Now, while I do understand that is part of my job, I was always shaking my head in disbelief when we were given the list of possible symptoms. Mood swings, irritability, lack of interest in schools, underperformance, changes in interests, etc. Well, since I work with teenagers, that list applies to about 90% of them. So, obviously, that list wasn't any help. A possible symptom of distress, not liking school. I mean... <laughs> I guess, like, 80% of the human workforce has psychological distress because they don't like the job. You know, hearing that back, I thought I was making a point against it, but I think I just made a point for it. <laughs> now, at the same time, I had a very provocative student who was two grades behind and who was just smug as hell. He always spent an unnerving amount of his potential trying to push his teacher's boundaries and see how far he could go. Luckily, I'm not that easy to anger, and always try not to play into the students' hands by doing exactly what they want me to do. So, if I notice that somebody tries to anger me, I give my best to speak even more calmly, etc. When I was grading a test in politics, I noticed that he didn't fill out a question, probably because he was once more a oblivious to the answer. Instead, he had used his time during the test to draw a little sketch made of stick figures. One stick figure, labeled as me, had its hand on a lever, up in a risen platform with a gallow. The stick figure with the head in the noose was labeled with his own name. At the feet of the gallows, the rest of the class was protesting with signs saying, STOP! or DON'T DO IT! I thought about what comment I might write next to it. Then, I remembered the training we were given over and over again. Obviously, the student was in distress, so I contacted the school psychologist and mentioned the disquieting sketch on the test. Two days later, during my lesson, there was a knock on my door. It was the school counselor who came to get the student for a psychological assessment. The sour look he gave me when he came back was marvelous. <laughs> Suck it, kid. You got something that as an adult could cost you up to $400. <laughs> Loser. Tackling your personal struggles and life issues early in life so you can be better as an adult. Car dealer tried to rip me off. Ended up having to pay inflated maintenance bill themselves. This happened about 17 years ago in a major city in the very south of the Netherlands with a Renault dealership. So I had a new job and we needed a second car. We bought a new Twingo, a car that went for about 1,200 pounds. Wait, no, Euro. Damn it! There were two stipulations in the contract when we bought the car. One was that we had to get financing through Renault, and two was that three years maintenance was included. We financed a minor part for three years at 0% interest. Now, after the first year, I took the car for its first service. I had about 12,000 kilometers on the odometer. When I dropped the car off, I was asked if there was any anything that needed attention. I think I answered something like, do whatever you need to do. Oh, you just know they're going to abuse that approval. In the late afternoon when I picked up the car, three rather bulky men were standing behind the service desk. I remember they were really focused on me when I was presented with the bill. The bill was for about a thousand euro. And for a one-year-old car with just 12 kilometers, I immediately understood what had happened. They must have figured out that they could inflate the bill with all kinds of nonsense maintenance action since I gave them carte blanche. And to avoid any troubles, they made sure that I could be intimidated by them being with three people. So those without car ownership and maintenance drama problems, I have a car that's 17 years old and over 200,000 Ks on the odometer. My last maintenance bill where I actually had to get repairs and replacements done cost me a maximum 700 
$1,500 on a 15-year-old car. Like, to get this sort of bill on a one-year-old car, you must have been taking it to a derby. That or you got extremely ripped off, either one. So I just very friendly asked for my car keys. But you have to pay first! No, I don't. Please, may I have my car keys? Instead of enlightening them straight away, I kept going like this for a bit longer. When things started to get a bit unfriendly, I reminded the rep that I had bought the car at this dealership, including three years of maintenance. All three guys turned a few shades lighter, frantically searching for the contract, whispering, moving away to the office out of earshot. It took about ten minutes before the rep came back out and handed me my key. I ended up getting its third service just before the three years had elapsed, and as soon as I got the title to the car, I traded it in for a different brand. And as you would expect, the bill for the second and third services was less than 300 to 400 euros. Not sure if this is the right Reddit. The compliance part is that they did everything they were supposed to do and way more. And I complied as well by reminding them that they were responsible for all costs. I just love how in the second and third year where you have driven the car for longer and therefore worn it out for longer, it suddenly somehow costs less than half price than the first year. You want to be in control? Fine! Years ago, I worked for a public institution where the supervisor was a control... <laughs> How did I just fail to use words? They were a total control freak. She was hardly able to delegate the most mundane tasks. And even when she did, she would monitor what her number two was doing and give him hell if he dared to call a shot himself. Now, in my field, by law... Everybody needs to follow 48 hours of mandatory continued training per three-year span. The state offers a wide selection of different courses you're free to pick from. If you want to get your training from any other agency and or private company, you need a permission from your supervisor. Okay, so at this workplace, you basically have like a driver's license, but every few years, instead of just paying to get it renewed, you actually have to get training to get it renewed. I'm assuming I interpreted it right there. Now, my former supervisor thought that some of these trainings were frivolous, like yoga classes. Wait, what? Oh, meant to prevent burnout. <laughs> Dude, that's great. You know how expensive some yoga classes are out there? Like $50 per two classes? What the frick is that? Or first aid classes, which according to her, you should or could do on your own time. So she decided that all training needed to be green Latin by herself, which was obviously against the law. Most colleagues decided to ignore that order, since it was illegal, and we can't be written up or otherwise disciplined for not following an illegal order. I, on the other hand, thought it would be more fun to comply. So I designed a permission form where I could copy and paste all information about the online curriculum within seconds and check the training offer. I picked quite a number of two-hour trainings and introduced a form for each one of them. Plus, I sent my form out to all the colleagues, around 175 of them, to make asking for permission easier for them. Quite many picked up on the idea and introduced my form for their trainings as well, so that the control freak supervisor was swamped with hundreds of forms within a single week. We were quite quickly back to being allowed to follow any of the state's trainings freely. You know, I'm kind of disappointed she didn't follow through with this and end up getting fired. That would have been a lot more satisfying. Secondhand store won't donate extra clothes because I didn't check a box on a form. Yay, bureaucracy! There's a store in my city where you can bring your unwanted clothes to and they will sort through them, buy the ones they like off of you and give the rest of them back. They also have an option to just drop a bag of clothes off and you can come back and pick up the ones they don't want later or you can just check the box to have them donate whatever is left. A few years ago, I dropped a bag of clothes off and figured I'd go through what they didn't want and when I picked up the money just to see if there was anything I might want to keep before it got donated, well, when I picked up the cash, and took a quick look through the bag, I told the person behind the counter, uh, thanks so much, I don't actually want any of these so they can be donated. She told me that she couldn't donate them because I hadn't checked the donate box on the form when I dropped my clothes off. I argued that shouldn't matter since they donate clothes anyway, so what's the difference? She was adamant that she would not take my clothes for donation. We went back and forth on this for a full minute or so, so with both of us getting more annoyed by the other, eventually I thought, fine. I'll play your little game. I picked up the bag and said, All right, thanks so much, and left the store. Five seconds later, I walked back in with the exact same bag saying, Oh, 
have a bag of clothes to sell and I'd just like to donate whatever you don't buy. She looked at me, peed off and said, fine, I'll just donate them. But next time, just check the box on the sheet. I walked out of there with my money and otherwise empty handed. Okay, hold, hold the phone, my buddy. Might be a hot take, but I kind of think you are the one who was the problem here. They clearly have you check the box for a reason because clearly the last thing they want to do is assume that you want to donate the rest of the clothes they don't want. Like I'd rather they do this than just to assume to donate the rest of them. Yes, but if you giving them those clothes to be sold to them. Clearly you don't want those clothes anyway. Sure, that's one factor. Maybe I'd be planning to use the clothes for something else. Either way, to get all hoity-toity at this worker for literally considering that maybe you didn't want these donated because you didn't tick the box. Like, oh, wow, yeah. What, what a terrible person. Could you imagine this person going up to a cafe? Excuse me, barista, you made me a caramel latte. Y yeah, because that's what you ordered. And how dare you? African exchange student. Here's my all-time favorite malicious compliance story. So I studied history in Germany, and while there, an African exchange student enrolled as well. He had a very thick accent and had quite a lot of trouble putting his thoughts on paper. So when an assignment was due, he asked the elderly professor if he could write the assignment in English, where he had way more ease expressing himself. Now, the elderly professor didn't want to admit that his English was rather bad. So instead, he referenced the university guidelines that stipulated that, except for language studies. All assignments were to be written in either German or Latin. Little did the professor know that the African exchange student was in fact schooled in a Jesuit monastery. So he did turn in the assignment in perfect Latin. Since the professor had specialized in modern history, he needed help of a Latin professor to grade the assignment. The university guidelines have been amended a year later. Assignments in Latin are only acceptable for those studying Latin anymore. And that elderly professor's ego is still going strong. We only speak to an attorney. Okay then. I was in a very bad car accident in 2021. I ended up with a five-day hospital stay and had to have months of physical therapy and follow-up care with a number of specialists. Most of the time, getting records, setting appointments, pre-authorization, or anything related to my care was simple and didn't involve much and almost always could be authorized by my name and birth date. I called a provider who had billed my insurance incorrectly so they wouldn't pay for it and I was getting stuck with the bill. The call went something like this. Company. Hello, this, please be advised this call may be recorded for training and quality purposes. How many uh, may, uh, God damn it, how may I help you today? Hi, I recently got care from X person at X location and there was some incorrect billing, so I am being billed for it and not the insurance company. Oh. Can I please have your name and birth date? I provide it. Oh, I am unable to speak with you about this matter. W what? Why not? Uh, I am only authorized to talk to an attorney about this matter. Is that, is that what I say? Yeah. Call that again. Off my back. Oh, all right. Me. Q. Malicious compliance. What the f- uh, Okay, then. I am representing myself for all legal matters. Now, please discuss this matter with me. <sighs> oh, um, uh, one moment, sir. I get put on hold for about three minutes, and when they come back, we get straight to discussing my issue and get it quickly resolved. I don't think they had run into that before and had to figure out if that loophole counted. It doesn't always should. You have to have an attorney, my butt. Mean waitresses left a neophyte waiter out to dry. Wow, I am learning all these new words today. Neophyte, a person who is new to a subject or activity. Just say new kid. <laughs> <laughs> Stop with these fancy words for simple things. I don't know if this qualifies as malicious compliance, but I think it's close. So I live in Sedona, Arizona, but would go down to Phoenix for doctor's appointments and big city stuff. I went to a sushi bar and my waiter was this poor college age guy, totally in over his head, but trying. He double checked my order, took forever to get my iced tea and was running all over the place. A bad service can be aggravating, but he was so panicked I felt sorry for for him. I get rattled easily and would be a terrible waitress so I could sympathize. I could see two female waitresses off in the corner glaring at him and gossiping. After I ate, I, he kind of disappeared. He may have been fired at this point, I don't really know. I waved at the two female waiters, nothing. 
After about 10 more minutes, I walked up and asked if I could get my bill. They huffed and made a comment that I wasn't their table, but they would check. I could see more grumbling. So they brought the check out, and it was the wrong one. About a third less than I had ordered. I tried to get their attention again, but they weren't having it. So I went to the register and paid. After I paid, I said I tried to get your attention and let you know you gave me the wrong bill. I think they thought I was going to ask for a refund. I just said thanks. My bill was a third than what it would have been. One of the waitresses looked a little panicky and said we'll do it over. I just said, no thanks, I'm fine. Bye bye. <laughs> To be fair, I'm not sure if that's legal because, I mean, even if it's a technicality issue, you still have to kind of pay for what you ordered, you know? I imagine if you go somewhere to get a product, uh, mostly food in this case, and they just hand it to you and kind of forget to expect or ask payment, it's still, you know, your responsibility to pay them. Just because they turned around to continue cleaning the back counter doesn't mean you get to walk away scot-free. Like, you, you still have an obligation. That said, I'm not a lawyer. I don't know the laws to that degree, so if anyone's actually aware of this sort of thing, let me know. I'm curious, can, are you free to just walk away if you don't get the correct billing? One one dollar locker, lockery ticket? Lottery ticket, please! Stopped at a convenience store to buy a drink. Sign in front of the register said, proceed to self-checkout unless buying lottery tickets or using cash. So, I have cash. Self-checkout is swamped and employees are standing around playing on their phones. So, I got the attention of one of the employees and requested one one dollar lottery ticket and... Yeah, ring up my drink as well. Scowls were across the employee's face. Best part was I went outside, scratched the ticket, and won $5, and we got to meet again as they paid me my hard-earned $5. People were still in line at the self-checkout. You know, this might seem like a win, but this convenience store successfully manipulated and pressured you into spending an extra dollar just to get out a bit earlier. But I guess if you're someone who cares about time equal to money, then, you know, in a way you might have actually saved money. Don't do anything else until this gets done. So, some background. My boss is usually a really cool guy, and I love working at my job, but some days he's just in a mood and decides that one thing is more important than anything else and it makes me drop everything. And when he's like this, he always ends his tirade with Don't argue with me, just do it! So I usually work to get it done as fast as possible while also getting my other work done. However, today I actually had some answers he's been waiting for. But he wasn't here this morning. Meetings happen, no big deal. And he sent me an email saying he'd be in this afternoon. No problem, I'll get done what I can. So he walks in and says his hellos and goes to his office to get settled. I always give him like 10 minutes before I hand him all the stuff I need him to deal with because I hate just throwing it on him when he comes in. So I get all my stuff together to go to talk to him. But he comes back out and slaps a paper on my desk. He's asking why this hasn't been dealt with yet. I explain, as I had before several times, that I can't get this done because it's a government document and they will not let let me make changes to our account on his behalf. He says, I don't need excuses, just get it done today. Don't take calls, don't do anything else, just get this done. I told him I can call them, but they won't talk to me. He would need to speak with them himself. I also told him the last time I called, I was on hold for over three hours. Because yay, government. He doesn't care. Don't worry about anything else until this is dealt with. Don't argue with me, just do it. You got it, boss. I've been on hold for about an hour now and have won a few games of solitaire. I think I'll switch to Mei, Mei, Mejong, Mei, Mejong, uh, that game in a bit. We can deal with my other stuff tomorrow. Oh, bonus, they have an option to leave a voicemail to get a call back, but last time I did that, they called long after business hours. Plus, uh, well, I was told to not worry about anything else. Accidental, Accidental basic, basic training, training malicious, malicious compliance. compliance. My dad was enlisted in the US Army during Vietnam, rather than potentially be drafted. In basic training, trainees were repeatedly told to do exactly what was told, not what the trainee thought he was supposed to do, even to the point of tricks play to make sure he was listening to exact instructions. So there he was on the range for grenade training. Pre-brief tells him as long as he does not let go of the arming spoon, Mr. Grenade is still your friend. Noted. When it comes to practice, the drill instructor tells the group, pull the pin and throw it high and long down range. My dad pulls the pin and throws the pin high and long down range. <laughs> 
<laughs> ah, it's so good. He keeps holding the grenade spoon, feeling perfectly safe as everyone else throws their grenade. He got push-ups. Apparently, there is no leeway for malicious compliance in army basic training. Nah, man, that's... <laughs> no, no. They He was merely proving his exact ability to listen to instructions. How dare you punish him? Strict adherence to contract backfires beautifully. Had to share this gem of a story from a few years back when I was contracting with a tech firm. Get your popcorn, because this one's a treat. Enter Mr. Grayson, the firm's new operations head. Now, this guy had a reputation for being a stickler for rules, often to the point of absurdity. Shortly after his arrival, contractors like myself were handed these freshly inked contracts. It was verbose, to say the least, but one clause stood out. All contractors shall adhere strictly to the tasks outlined in their contract. Any deviation will result in immediate termination. This was Mr. Grayson's baby. His attempt to ensure we stayed in our designated lanes. Now, for context, the firm had a history of a collaborative environment. Developers would occasionally assist with design queries, and designers, like me, would sometimes offer input on usability to the developers. But Grayson, oh no, he wanted none of that cross-departmental nonsense. Yeah, because how dare you try to work with the people you work with, huh? Now, on to the malicious compliance. A big project was on the horizon, and Midway, the development team hit a snag. They identified a design flaw, something my team could have fixed in an hour or two. However, helping them wasn't in my contract. So I sat back, sipped my coffee, and watched the drama unfold. The developers, bound by their contracts, spent days trying to engineer their way around a problem that wasn't theirs to solve. The project timeline got stretched, costs increased, and frustrations bubbled. The climax? A big meeting with higher-ups where Grayson had to explain the delays. When the design flaw was brought up, all eyes turned to me. I simply slid a copy of my contract across the table and highlighted the strict adherence clause. I recall the deafening silence in the room, broken only by Grayson's stammering. <laughs> in the aftermath, Grayson's strict contract idea was trashed. Collaboration resumed, the project got back on track, and our dear Mr. Grayson, well, he was reassigned to a different department, far away from meddling with contracts. I mean, what a stupid thing to put through in the first place. I sincerely hope this man was like fresh into the company because there is no way you could have been working in that company, seeing how it all worked and then thought, hey, what if I, what if I put a stick in the middle of my bike wheel? That, yeah. Yeah, now that'll make it go faster, won't it? 